Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this leadership conversation. And today I'm joined by Mary McPhillips, CEO of the Daughters of Charity Community Services. Good afternoon, Mary. Good afternoon, Karen. How are you? I'm great, thank you. And I'm delighted that you could join me for this reflective conversation. So I'm I'm curious about about this, the experiences that CEOs are having in their leadership positions over the last seven months. So I'm interested in what the experience has been like. I'm interested in what you're learning then about leadership, because I think leadership is evolving all the time, it's our understanding of it and how we express it. Um, so the experience and then what your leadership, what, what you're learning from, from the experience. But to begin with, why don't you introduce yourself, Mary? Tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay, well, my name is um, Mary McPhillips, and as some of you will, I'd say, automatically um, cop on. I'm from um, a border county from County Monaghan, and I've managed to hold on to the accent for long and many a day. I um, came to Dublin to go to college in um, the early 80s, and I um, have been in Dublin um, since. I'm married um, to a Dubliner and um, have two, two um, lads. Um, my background was in education. I grew up on, in, in a farm in uh, County Monaghan and my background, I studied maths and, and computers at college and started off as a secondary school teacher. And um, I also am a twin and um, she also went to Trinity College and studied maths. So at one stage in my early maths life, I heard uh, an inspector from the Department of Education said he was coming out to inspect one of the mathematician twins. And I remember hearing that and think it's not really a thing you want to hear in your 20s. Do you know, I remember thinking to myself, do you really want that in my gravestone? And um, so that kind of was there. And I was working in a school that was was um, poor at the, at the time and I kind of struggled with having skills to work with the parents. So at that stage, I took a, a year off school and studied in All Hallows College and did a leadership um, a holistic management course then okay. with the view to kind of come back into education. Anyway, long story variable, I ended up in, in All Hallows College on the staff, having uh, worked for a year with Limerick Diocese. And um, I was there then for over 20 years and I had a mix of roles. I started off um, running the conference centre on the condition that if openings came in other areas that I uh, would be given a license to, to practice or whatever. And I did some training in supervision and facilitation. So I did a mix of running the conference centre and doing some supervision with um, students on the BA and MA programmes. So with that combination for a number of years. And then I went on to, um, to get involved with a, new, a presidential change and I took over um, head of operations. And I um, oversaw that for about three years. And then when the college went into Wangdan, I oversaw that process as the president went back to the States. So we had a lot of redundancies and we had students to make, um, to help complete the degree. So the negotiation of the sale to DCU and the overseeing of that wind down process, um, I led that piece. So when that was finished then, I, I suppose I was left with a, a still a desire. My desire was always kind of around education and improving the lot, or if there was anything I could do to, um, yeah, to improve the lot. And I think after the experience of All Hallows and crystallised really what our priorities, I wanted to make a commitment to, to work but I certainly thought it would make a difference. And that's how I come to apply for um, the Doris of Charity Community Service, the CEO role. And I'm now three years in that role. Okay, great. So, so you bring a whole lot of experience to, to your role and in the last seven months. So when, so when COVID-19 hit in March, so as you reflect back on the last seven months, what's, what's the experience been like for you in the CEO role? And see you know, okay experience for me i would say um kieran i say about one of my young fellas that he warms slowly to his task um and when he gets going he takes off and he might have inherited that from me and i wouldn't have seen that before no i think moving into this role as CEO, I have struggled a bit with role identity and it has taken me a lot i was very conscious of what i didn't know rather than maybe what i had no one, and I suppose internal voices was very hard on myself. In a way, COVID, maybe because it mirrored some of the crisis of what happened in the wind down, but 
I'm good at galvanizing and I'm not bad in a crisis. So in a way, it helped me to clarify my role and give direction and not doubt myself because we didn't have the time for that. Um, so there was some clarity of role and distinguishing my role from the board's role and clear in from me and clearing up what needed to go to the board and being strategic about how to do things that happened during COVID. Okay. So now, sorry, go on, yeah, go on. Yeah, it's kind of ironic because when COVID hit, a number of our services locked down. That was the government. And the only one that stayed open, open was our seniors. And they were all remote, obviously, because they were cocooning. And we really developed a very strong, um, a very strong response to our seniors. It'd be one of the pieces I would, would, be, would be proud of. Mm -hmm. So I think that the shift in focus in terms of, in the role of CEO, I have a role across all the services. But for that period, a number of them were locked down initially and the focus went on the seniors. And we had a new manager that had started two days before the COVID thing hit. Okay. So that became a focus to give the best possible services to seniors in the light of they were the most vulnerable of our participants and in line with the, with the government guidelines of services closed down. So that galvanized and I got a small group round um, and that new manager is excellent. And that got a piece of work going that was the response. Now, there was huge issues for that in me. I mean, one of the things I learned was around my naivete. I learned a whole lot of stuff around that. But I think the shift in focus. So when you say the shift in focus, so the shift in focus from what to what? I have set, there's six services here. So in, in COVID, one service became the most vulnerable and the rest of them were closed nationally. So the focus became very much about delivering service to the most vulnerable and doing that extremely well. And then the other services came back in. So all of my focus went on one service or most of it, along with closing down the rest. So there was a period there where they got a lot of focus. And I think what that did for me was It connected me to the mission. It connected me to the mission in spades. Okay. And I also think that the small group of us worked extremely well. There was very little ego in the room. The focus of the participants was the mantra every day. And, 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 was, think, that, and was that different than your experience of previous to COVID because my sense is that that's happened in a number of organizations not to say that there was something significantly absent but there was something about the experience of COVID that enabled people to, to dig deep and to really focus and you're coming there about the, an absence of ego in the room so so how did it, how did the experience contrast the experience of that contrast with what was there before I suppose it stripped um, things back to its essentials in terms of in the CEO, you're dealing with funding, you're dealing with, with a complex array of um, tasks that have to be complete. But for the immediate piece, there was a piece there that connected with the mission because these are 70 people in um, Dublin um, who are cocooning. And a lot of, some of them are getting meals and fees and certainly some of them were getting a service here that they can no longer get. So what is the best possible service that you can give them? And we have support service. I mean, it was quite complex what we put in place, but I think very good. Okay, okay. So it simplified at one level. And I don't know whether it was chance that the, the few people that galvanized around that group, which were somebody from support, that new manager and myself, and we just, um, whether it was just a lucky combination or whether it was because things were stripped back, the focus was very clear. I'm not sure. And, then you, and you said then it also helped to connect really to the purpose. So, so you're talking now with the benefit of hindsight. So you're kind of reflecting back and it seems uh, uh, there's been a lot of insight for you. So give us a sense of how were you experiencing yourself during the seven months? So because 
it's been a seven months a lot has happened in the seven months so mm-hmm. how did you experience yourself during those seven months and again I, i'm imagining there's lots of different dimensions as you might mm. just mention a, a couple mm. Mm. um i've experienced myself one of the things are you which i'd never have thought about myself is um i experienced myself as naive in terms of assuming that because of the um situation was such in the country that the values would come to the fore and um people would rock up and i think that was very naive because obviously a pandemic put people into survival mode and you mean you're at maslow's basic needs yeah. and so i think that was the first thing and i therefore i assumed if people if values are going to come to the fore which they did in that case around seniors that that um you know you're not going to need um not that you're not going to need but what i would say is the need for boundaries the need for a lead to need to be clear to point to the priorities those things didn't lessen and i assumed they would so say a bit more about that so Well, you get all range of behaviors. You get, um, you know, you get people who would nearly put their lives at risk to deliver the mission. You'll get um, people who will think, "How am I going to survive in that? In this?" And okay. without much concern for every for for others, and you get everything in between. Okay, so a and real it, range of responses in, in the way people responded, and and what. What, what I, I suppose the bit, the bit, sorry, Karen, the bit okay. I learned was, I was actually surprised that, that I, I wouldn't have thought that. Because okay. of course that would, I mean, it's, it's, I think it's quite natural that in a pandemic, those range of, when I'm sitting here with the logical hat, but you asked me about the experience, yeah. and the experience in the time, that's not what I expected. Yeah. I knew I expected everybody would be doing it a certain way. And I've had that experience before. I've had to learn that a few times. Um, you know there's something i seem to have to keep learning um but so therefore being clear about this is what we're doing this is what we're not doing um etc keeping boundaries um all of those things were no less important um okay. during covid and i had made an assumption that they would be okay okay that they'd be less important yeah 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 that they'd be less important um that's one piece what was the question again you asked me what so just about about how you've experienced yourself over the last yeah. seven months yeah so you said yeah so you experienced yourself as naive mm-hmm. and you made assumptions mm-hmm. about how people would respond and then what you discovered was people respond in a whole there's a very broad scope um yeah. and that's okay yeah uh, but you you surprised yourself and that you, you, did, yeah. you made a different assumption I think as time went on, I, I learned to depersonalize that, and, you know, and say this is um, this is not directed at me. This is actually actually normal behavior for people that haven't been in this experience. I'm having, I'm showing my behavior one way. Other people are another way, and therefore my job here is actually to give good direction and good leadership. Now, I find a bit of conflict in myself as well because in the initial stages. Do you know they talk about leaders need to be able to see around corners? Well, in the initial stages of COVID, I mean, you couldn't see the corner. Um, like, so in the initial stages, people expected you to have the map as to what okay. would happen. And I remember one day in that meeting with one of the seniors, said, what's the longer term plan? And I said, folks, we don't have the longer term plan. This is what we're doing. And we're meeting every day at three o'clock. Because I think there's a timing thing about when the plan needs to be galvanized, when you know enough, and yet you need to um, get started. So holding that balance and being okay as a leader to say, I actually don't know what the longer term plan is, but I do have confidence in this group of people and the way we're attending to the needs of participants that we will get a longer term plan, but it's not there yet. Okay. And holding that ground. Holding the ground that between the, the tension of not knowing 
and but then a kind of a reass- a conviction that actually that you you you'd, you'd be able to to manage things when they arose. Yeah, and, and how- I would have got, got feedback from staff that said they they found that very useful, um, in terms of putting the brakes on and holding the ground. And that was one of the things you asked about the experience. That was one of the experiences at times of having to build the container. Okay, the container about for what? For loads of things, for the balance of being like reactive and proactive, holding that, holding the range of emotions that people felt and the behaviours. Some people would, I mean, there's the range of behaviours with regard to COVID, whether, you know, it was real or not. And like, that's just a bug. There's that to people who would be very conservative and uh, in their approach to nine themselves around COVID and feel they'd need to cocoon permanently. And everything in between. So you have to be a container um, for that. You have to be a container in terms of you have to react to what's happened to the to the government um, protocols, and we did. But you also then have to be proactive. What does that mean? How are we going to deliver that service in a way we've never delivered it before? Okay. And also with some of the ones that they, that they were closed down. I mean, you can't expect early years early years work. The early years was closed down. And that was the initial. But after a week, and when you've got something bedded down for the seniors, then you need to go back and actually say, okay, well now what can we do for the families? This is going to actually continue for a longer period of time when we're getting the, the seeing what's coming and what are we actually going to do to actually resource families and how can we do that? Okay. And the same with our training centre, et cetera, et cetera. That was my experience of it. Yeah. So, so, so part of what you found was, as you said, that, that idea of being a container. For, for lots of stuff. Yeah. And was that very different than a year ago? Probably not, Kieran, other than the service were being delivered a certain way a year ago. The fund streams were coming in um, to match that. This required to contain people to actually make a shift and to contain them in the not knowing so that we could get to another stage of delivering services. So I'd say you're always a container, but it got accentuated for me in the period. And I don't know if that happened. For for me, it got accentuated. And maybe it was built into the naivety that I didn't think I'd have to do it. I don't know. Okay, okay. And what was the experience like of being in a leadership position where, where the expectation of you might have been you need to be able to see around the corner. So yeah. what, what was the experience like for you in being in a place where you didn't have the answers? Because there's lots of expectations on leaders, yeah. I observe, uh, both from staff yeah. and also from boards to be, yeah, to be able to look around corners, to, to, to know the answers, to be in control, to be given lots of guidance. So what was it like for you to be in a position where you didn't know the answers? I like to I like to have the plan and I would be a planner but my previous experience in that hollows around the wind down I used to have an image of being in a field <laughs> good country girl being in a field and you know, the grass was high but there was there was a, a, an exit the other side but I didn't know where it was okay and we had to get a map, we had to get, and we had a load of people to get out the other side of that plate. That was kind of an image. And so I had previous experience of not knowing and saying, you have to live with not knowing for a while and things you're doing strategically to actually give you the resources to, to help you and develop the plan. So I had a wee bit of a previous experience to that, that I could trust saying, you know, I do remember that colleague saying to me, what's the bigger plan? I said, hmm don't have the bigger plan yet okay. and you're going to have to trust me in this um but we do know this is what we're doing for now and we can sustain this and we're putting plans in place to keep people healthy so that we can deliver if one thing goes down that the participants won't suffer okay. so we were doing stuff in the here and now and kind of trying to clear what do we need to look at longer term okay. so it, it, yeah it felt i don't it's not my favourite um, feeling of not knowing and people expect me to know and me having that expectation of myself. But I did have the experience of before and knew I had 
Okay. I felt I'd come through it and done a, 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 a more than okay job. And is that metaphor that you had when you before of being in a field with long grass? Mm -hmm. You knew mm -hmm. there was a gate somewhere and you had to get. Big, is that yes. does that metaphor capture part you know, the part of the experience of the last seven months, or is there a different? Or would you revise the metaphor, or have you an alternative one to describe the experience? I, I would. I wouldn't use the same metaphor. I wouldn't use the same metaphor. For me, it was nearly like growing up in the road a bit. Okay. Um. I don't know. I think in some of the um, situations that I kind of nearly got a little strategy of how to work that helped me. So getting clear about the issue and what it's like in the organization in terms of, is it a policy and procedure? Is it resource? Is it an implication on how we do our work? What is it? Um, so that'd be one part of, of um, getting clear Clear so is, this a, is this a technique that you developed yeah, I think as a way of coping? Yeah, or can you say, or growing up through the process of doing it, this is kind of what I've developed, looking at the issue, stamping back. I'm actually quite good strategically, but I don't, I'm so busy doing it sometimes, I don't give myself the time to do it. Okay. And when I did it with a couple of pieces that were quite successful, or I think the participants benefited, um, the participants with the centres said, who would I need now to have included in that. What would in what part of that is belongs to the board? What decision making needs from the board, etc. Um, and being clear, using the boundaries, then to say what is my role in this, and you know maybe what is the board's role. That's very jumbled. But I suppose all I'm saying is that my experience has been, I think, of growing up a bit in the role. Um, we had a new um, manager for seniors. And we were in transition on finance. So I was doing a lot of the finance okay. stuff as well mm. from the inside out. And maybe, maybe that's the learning, Kieran. Maybe that is the learning that I actually learned better from the inside out. You're so that I better for the inside out, you mean by, by doing stuff? Yeah, and being close to the service delivery informed me practice. Okay. And, and that, that wouldn't um, have been, you wouldn't have had that hands-on approach, that inside-out approach before? Or I would have bits and pieces, but not, not as much, no. Okay. okay, okay, okay. So when you say you've grown up in the role, so... Mm. You're afraid to come back to that, yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> these things come, come back and eat you. Um, uh, well, say a bit more about it, because I... Yeah, my conviction is that you, we're all the time changing and we're all the time responding to the circumstances we find ourselves in and we're learning and growing and maturing and you know everything so stuff is always shifting so that, that, that the idea that, that you would say that you grew up in the role that you're, you've grown in the role that makes that makes perfect sense i'm curious yeah. as to what yeah say a bit more about the growing up what, what, I don't think that I'd say like I'm, I'm growing up in the role, but I, I would have thought um, that I, 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 as a result of the experience, that I'm clearer on my role and on the board role through all of this. I have I have got more, um, I suppose, reflective on the practice to say what is my role in this and what is the board role in um, that and we're very blessed with a good board so, yeah so that would be um one piece of it the other piece of it um is trying at times to delegate maybe a, a task that would would allow me more time to be strategic and do the do the piece now i i have a lot more growing up to do in that way why? Because what's your, what, what's your pattern? Because I think my pattern is um, I think my, my style is the people and that's why I had the naivety. I think people will learn by looking at the way I, I, the way I, the way I do things is a model for how I want them done. Okay, okay. And um, but 
so I'm not always good at, at delegating. I would take on to make somebody else's life easier. And I think I need to get better at that and say, no, um, do it. Or, or would you do this for me? Now, don't get me wrong, there are people, and I do practice it, but I think I need to practice it more. Okay, okay. And therefore, if you're doing all the time, it's hard to get back from it and actually be um, strategic about, you know, what are the next, what's the prudent next steps? And they take sifting. Now, I do think I probably walked a bit more during uh, COVID and that always helps me with um, sift and stuff. Just the virtue of a long walk seems to help it rearrange it in me, in yeah. me, in this. And I think, it. yeah. So was it, was it just in terms of the hours that you were working, the level, the level of preoccupation? I remember working or talking with the CEO some time ago and they said, I might be the busiest person in the organization, but I'm the most preoccupied. The sense that you're always thinking about the organization, even though so it's not a, just an, a nine to five job. So there's some, it's a preoccupation. Were you finding that you were working longer hours, um, more preoccupied, you know, stress levels because of the uncertainty managing those you know being that container for everybody what, what, from that perspective what was the yeah. experience like yeah i'd say that's true i think of me in the role in general about the preoccupation i'd say it it um, i try and i do practice a uh, good brand certainly was working long hours and um because of the desire to have um, as many people at home as possible, which we did. That meant you were hands on every day. And I mean, I had very little time. I, I don't think I, I had one day off on the 21st of April. Okay. Um, and working lo long hours, yes. Um, and you can sustain that for a short period of time, but you yeah. can't sustain it in the longer period of time. Now, I do think with um, what I call phase two, which was when we were doing the phase reopening, that was um, very different. And we have a level of staff and a level of participants back. Well, all participants back for our seniors in, in a socially distant manner, et cetera. Um, so therefore we'd have more bodies, um, if you like, now than we had then. And because we were trying to keep teams separate, didn't want to be mixing that up at all in terms of, um, yeah in terms of the service. So it was, um, your question was? About the level of preoccupation yeah. and, and hours yeah. worked and stress and. Yeah, I mean, I, I, mean, I mean, honest to God, when the government thing had come out on a Thursday or Friday, said, why don't they do this on a Monday? To actually give us time to get it ready for seniors, leaving seniors worrying about what the hell it is it means, um, was now, so I'd be preoccupied, I'd be eating the documents then at the weekend to see if I get ahead of it. Um, <laughs> there's no getting out of it. <laughs> um, our new protocols come out and say, what does that mean for us? Um, so yes, we're preoccupied. So you mentioned they're walking. What other activities did you do outside of work to try and, yeah, just, I guess, but how did you sustain yourself? How did you resource yourself? How, do you, how did you stay resilient? Yeah, I think I was very blessed. I got a new, um, supervisor slash coach this time last year. And I think that has been really good for me in terms of um, keeping that anchored and making sure I get time back. That has been, um, and I mean, I think I've talked before sometimes with the isolation of being a CEO, it certainly has reduced the isolation of, uh, of a CEO in terms of knowing that that's there. Um, the other thing were very simple things. I mean, at home, we took on on, on a Saturday night that we would uh, get a new recipe, get all the ingredients, and um, two, two of the family would make a, a drink that we didn't either a cocktail or do something, and the other two would cook, and we'd sit down and have, I mean, we cook every day, but we would do something outside our comfort zone okay. that was new. So those kind of things. The other thing was, I have learned this lesson, Karen, so many times that when, I, when I'm in a situation, um, you know, the way you're so preoccupied and wanting to do the next thing or whatever else, I say, 
I have experienced them, the loss of that. And I'm saying, I need to appreciate the moment. And I tried to do a bit more of that, to say, we are doing a good service. These people that I'm making, to, this is a good service. Whatever's happening, that the next piece we're looking at, this is progress. At home, I tried to say, I mean, I have two young fellas going to college, they wouldn't be at home. Um, I'm probably other than COVID. In two years' time, they will be gone. Um, so let me enjoy that. One of them took me out running. I say he's ruined the day of that. But it, that was one of the activities that, that we did together. And um, normally I'd be saying no to that. Um, so there was, there was bits and pieces, is what I would say, that uh, sustained me. Okay. Okay. Humour. Nice. Humour. I would have to say, humour, I would say, is one that sustains me a lot of the time but I can not crack out of and I can you know exaggerate myself to the nth degree and laugh at it um and you know that helps and a connection with people as well and and also seeing the difference seeing the difference that the that the um that the responses we were doing made that would um sustain you for the tough days. Okay. So in five years time, when you look back at your experience of being a CEO during COVID-19, what are the things you'd like to be able to point to and say, yeah, I'm proud of that, or I got that right, or I really nailed that? If there be three things, what would they be? I think one of them here would be around being good in, or being good in a crisis. I think I do panic, but I think um, I can give the impression that I'm not. Um, I won't run away in a crisis. I might feel like it, and um, you know I've had that experience of feeling um, that I'd want to run and saying, "No, Mary, you ha you have to stay," and this is you know. Um, this is where the you know. So you're good the in the crisis. Yeah. Huh? You're good. You're good in the just. I think about the saying, Yeah, if I want to be remembered, look and say I was trustworthy around participants and getting the best we could for them. Okay. That would be important. Um, if I look back and say I encourage the leadership of others, I don't. I don't feel the need to have the answers. I can listen in a room and say that'll work and that'll work and the idea I had is crap and that's great we have two now ideas to work but I, I would hope I encourage the leadership of others um, and I'd say maybe hold my nerve I had my nerve that you know um, if I believe in the thing is right and you're getting lots of opposition that can be born out of, out of um, many different things I think I can hear it if it if it needs to be revised, but it can also hold me nerve. Um, don't find that easy now either, but I, I can hold me nerve, and that's what I'd want to be remembered for. Okay. And what were some of the things you had to hold your nerve on? I think I had to hold hold me nerve about the combination of staff we we needed to come in. Really I think, tough. yeah, I think I had to hold me nerve. Um, our IT, that was one thing I learned, our IT systems are not good. We tried to get people to remote work from home and we didn't have the facilities. I had to, I had to hold me nerve there, say we're given access and um, to people to work from home and um, and hold me nerve to say, we don't have the facilities, but we will build them. And like okay. start slow and it means two laptops, add two more to it. That's the way we'd go. Okay. Okay. So it was times that owe me nerve about small and bigger things, you know, uh, around um around COVID also around um you know we we took a decision. <laughs> right, took a decision that we would keep the two meters apart, say for our training centre, there's questions about whether they go to one meter. And I'm I'm saying it's such a mix and such a um, vulnerable co we're going with two meters across the organization and I held me nerve. And uh, I, you know, those push, and I said, no, we're going, if we know we are two meters and everybody's staying safe and systems are up and running, we'll review. 
but we're going with two meters and everybody's on the two meter road. Adult education, um, compared the early years, but all our participants are on the two meter road and they're not changing it in level, you know, coming into level five, I probably would have been getting to the stage where it would have reduced that back a bit um, because the system seems to be touch wood and thank God working. Um, but now I'm saying, no, we're in level five and we actually need to hold our ground. We don't want to be taking any more risks. It's more live in the community. And um, so we've got some pushback on that. And I'm saying, no, this is, this is the way we're doing it. You mentioned earlier on that you grew up in the role um, but that, and mm -hmm. that there's further growing to do. So mm -hmm. what further growing would you say you need to do in the role? So I'm, I'm thinking this mm -hmm. situation can continue for another six, nine, mm -hmm. You don't know where we we don't know how long it's going to continue, mm -hmm. and we don't know what the long term implications mm -hmm. are going to be. So there will be mm -hmm. continual requirement to continue learning in your mm -hmm. role. So what what would you know what further growing in the role do you think you need to do? I think one of the things I um, would need to grow in the role is around um, was it around communication? I was very good in the beginning of the. COVID around communicating with the board, communicating with funders and sending emails out internally like as a, an update. Here we are folks, this is what we're doing. But we had a combination of people who worked off campus, who were working remotely, some doing support. So they would have been doing counselling, doing um, support one-on-one. -on -one. And I have had the odd conversations and come back and some of them felt isolated. And seem to pick up a view that that if you were off campus, you weren't working. Okay. They felt that that was implied. Now you can't control everything. It's not that I'm looking to control it, but when it was said, and it wasn't said to me as a, I just asked them how they felt during COVID. We're doing a review and it, it came up in that sense of being maybe isolated and i've heard it from other people that working at home and um, has been is isolating and i suppose that would be the question about how you foster appreciation for i did appreciate the work and i know trojan work was done I, I, there's not a doubt in my mind about it um but the question in my head is what got, got communicated. And even though I did kind of, and every, and I did have telephone calls with people, that's a kind of a curiosity about how you communicate that that is an appreciation of all. And how did that, there was nearly like a, um, no, I also know the dynamics were very different. I also know that for the people that were in working they were run off their feet because the numbers were were low so uh, yeah but the question for me is uh, yeah i don't like to feel that people would be isolated no i mean people can feel isolated and it's not my responsibility but it does beg a question about communication and um so what i like about the way you you're saying is how do you how do you communicate appreciation in a way that it lands for people yeah it's easy enough to yeah. communicate decisions or something like that they're kind of quite quite straightforward but how do you communicate appreciation is what you're you, you're saying there and i think i could do it all right kieran if i did it um it's yeah. actually being attentive being attentive to the need for it yeah I, I labeled it there as communication but being attentive i think if i um there's a guy you used to work with and you say when do you smoke your pipe um, that if you're in leadership, you needed to smoke a pipe. And his image was you put your feet up on the, the desk and you smoked your pipe and you just thought about it all. Um, but I think if I was smoking the pipe, I'd be saying, like, um, how do you, there's not necessarily communication is the issue, but it is the appreciation. And I think also if I was smoking the pipe, I'd know it. I'd be, I'd be in, intuit, I'd be intuiting that some people are probably feeling I've been decided this. So, so if I was quieter. So you need to smoke the pipe. Yeah. Put the feet up on the desk. As you look to the future, what what don't you know about the future? 
that, that are key very members. <laughs> okay, so for, you know, there's something in terms of your organi your role as CEO as you look to the future. What are the kind of critical unknowns? Uh, Fonten, and and especially with the um, childcare, it's very very vulnerable, very very vulnerable, and that's a concern. And it's more than a concern. It's, it'd be a um, it's a real one that come down to the mission because we will be serving very vulnerable families and that whole new childcare scheme is to support parents at work it's not it's not about childcare it's about families at work you know okay. so um it would reduce our fund hugely so that's a major one um and could we get masked a bit by covid because we were closed for a number of months we did pay salaries but relief sal relief and that kind of staff wasn't needed so it could it could mask okay. some of the issue so funding, um, funding is one yeah, the, well, I think a huge one is going to be the underbelly as a result of COVID. Our experience is with with um, with our participants that even when we um, offered our service, that you could you could see that we actually tapped in because we did phone support and um, counselling over the phone. We actually tapped into issues that were there already, but that we hadn't unearthed, say, in our meals and feed service. So we 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 um, tapped into issues. Those issues are, are going to be ongoing, and some of them are going to be exacerbated. And capacity is going to be more limited as a result of COVID for seniors. Okay. okay. And it lessens that cohort and their capacity. And we have seen it. If you took, I mean, I could say out of seventy. I mean, I think seven or eight have gone from living independently to not living independently and a deterioration mm -hmm. in incapacity. And that's very visible. It's there in not as visible. So there's hidden. Um, so that I certainly don't know what that is going to be. What are the hidden um, costs of not money, the hidden effects? of COVID on, on people and people's well-being and capacity. I suspect it will have reduced down capacity of seniors that they may not get back. Okay, okay. So we're just coming to the end, Mary. Uh, is there anything about your leadership experience that you reflected on and maybe in anticipation of this conversation that you haven't had the opportunity to mention that you'd like to say? Well, it went a very different way than, than, than um, um, I thought. Um, I, I suppose, I mean, I don't know, but um, about my leadership, I suppose the only thing that I can say is that it's been a very... Um, But one thing that I did notice was with the shift of the focus on, in the organization, the things changed. Um, and that was one thing that I noticed. The change continued to happen, even though you were trying to affect change and working harder. But the shift of focus, some of the changes continued. And that was a good thing. Okay. Um, that, um, and that was a lesson that I did learn that. Um, yeah. Uh, and what, was, what was the lesson you learned? The, the lesson I learned is that change isn't dependent on me. Okay. That there's other that there are other people, other drivers that can bring about change. Is that? Yeah. Okay. And sometimes that if you start something, um I have a strong work ethic and keep them going be important, but sometimes leaving it alone. Is important too. Okay. So that and now they'd be very um, paradoxical to me. Way of being. So, so what you know? happens when you leave it alone? Some of the change that has happened can continue. Okay. okay. Or it ferments, or other people come up with um, there are other drivers that come to the fore, okay. or other drivers that affirm the, what you were initiating, and you're not that involved in it at all yourself. So stepping back and be a, yeah. create the space for other people to step into it. Mary, 
Thank you very much for joining me for this conversation. Uh, I've really enjoyed it, and, and I'm sure it will be a benefit to people who watch it. People in similar roles uh, will benefit from the reflections and the insights that you're offering. So thank you very much for joining me today. You're welcome.